Today, I sat down with Jerry Eisenberg, a kindred spirit. Jerry is suing the Brentwood School in Los Angeles. The suit is based on what he alleges is a discriminatory and anti-Semitic curriculum. Jerry is an example of what many other parents are feeling right now across America. He is a brave leader in attempting to bring more common sense to our schools. So Jerry, I remember the moment I opened up my phone and I saw a social media blow up. There was a, you know, everything everywhere was written up. A parent from Los Angeles, nonetheless, is suing the Brentwood School because he is dissatisfied with the service that his child has gotten at the school. And finally, somebody is speaking out. And when I read these articles, I said to myself, oh, my God. We're not alone. Finally, some courage, the courage we've been praying for. And so it is amazing to sit with you today. Thank you. Um, and thank you. And thank you on behalf of many of the parents out there who have been praying and looking for somebody who is willing to take leadership for our children. Thanks. It was just a matter of being somebody, right? Somebody, there were all these groups of parents who were dissatisfied even more than me as to what happened last year to this school. And the consensus was somebody has to do something. Somebody has to hold them accountable. Somebody has to stand up. And I guess that just ended up being me this time. So tell me a little bit about the Brentwood School. I mean, it's not an inexpensive school and it's a very difficult school to get into. What was that experience for, for your daughter, right? Yes, it was challenging. A series of interviews, series of meetings. It's a whole dog and pony show. And the school came across as a very conservative, traditional, school um, that welcomed all communities, all groups, and something that we were really looking forward to uh, getting into. My daughter's smart, she is a great kid, and they accepted her. And we were very proud of that fact, and she was proud of that fact. Uh, seventh grade was amazing, and then eighth grade started uh, completely differently than seventh grade. So what happened, I, I can definitely relate to this experience that when parents, uh, including myself, you tour the school and you ask the question, you know, do you accept diversity of thought? Do you have kids from different backgrounds? The answer is always yes. Of course, we have no problem with people who are conservative at our school. Of course, we accept diversity of thought. And then we send our kids to these schools. And then a couple of years later, we start discovering that the tolerance is not quite there for a certain demographic. Is that what happened to you? What, what has happened to your daughter that you realized, well, this is not quite what I was promised or what I signed up for? Well, the school had, took a lot of heat uh, after the George Floyd um, murder, and they decided to come out very uh, much in favor of the movement, that uh, awakening of social justice. So they put a blackout square on their school website, and a number of, of the African-American students that had gone there said, are you kidding me? You are the least tolerant, the least inclusive school. And the school just, instead of saying we disagree, just started apologizing. And they were apologizing all through the summer. I even wrote a letter to the headmaster and said, you know, I, this is tough. Be strong if we can help you, our family. And then we show up to the start of school. And it's all during Zoom. And my daughter's English curriculum had changed 180 degrees. Every book that had traditionally been in this class, books of value and weight and literature were gone. And they were replaced by Ibrahim Kandi's book, uh, a bunch of summer reading light literature that won Pulitzer Prizes for uh, social justice, uh, one book called Justice, the sequel to Justice, a book about Filipino drug dealers and inner community rape and, and social warrior justice. And it was crazy. And history became the 1619 Project. And, and all the leaders were uh, deemed, Jefferson was deemed a bad guy and Lincoln was a deemed bad guy and Trump was deemed the worst guy. So I think that the Brentwood School is not unique in its taking this kind of approach of apologizing and even using children and students as the cannon fodder for them to 
I guess, display this act of justice that suddenly, you know, they were so inclusive by just, you know, throwing the kids under the sure. under the bush or yeah. under the rug to just like make them feel good, right? But so what in what about the books that you had expected them to learn? Was the curriculum just changed without parents being notified? No or notice. Or you sent some sort of letter saying, you know, dear parents, last year we taught Shakespeare, this year we will no longer teach? No. It was, this is it. This is what we're doing now. Uh, if you want your kid to read Shakespeare, do it on your own time. And it wasn't even so much that the children needed. It was something that assuaged the egos of the adults. They had a, a one-day seminar in white privilege. And yes, you have to be privileged to go to Brentwood School. I'm not sure you have to be white and privileged. And I don't need this school to tell me that my daughter is white privileged. Right? Uh, I don't need to then teach my daughter how to be an anti-racist. Uh, I think that whole configuration is odd to begin with. And th every step of the way, this school more mismanaged how to do this the right way. They paid millions of dollars for uh, DEI consultants, right? So they would have a group for the uh, black families and the Latino families and the Asian families and the white families and the Jewish families. But if you were white, you couldn't go to the black group. If you were black, you couldn't go to the Hispanic group. It was like backwards. It was like a systemic segregation through an attempt to create an integration. And if you disagreed, you were not allowed to see at the table. And everybody has a seat I mean, at the table. you mentioned that, of course, you have to be privileged to go to the Brentwood School. You have to be privileged in that you are able to afford these astronomical bills. Sure. Right? What's the cost of... of $50,000 before they ask you for donations. Okay, $50,000, and then on top of it, they ask for donations. Yes. Now, my guess is that they did not waive those requirements. So there wasn't some sort of, oh, well, let's open up for the underprivileged kids who want to come into the school. They're still going to charge the same amount, but then they're using the kids that they have there to basically pretend that they care so much about the underprivileged. And I'm sure there's a certain group that... Um, for their intelligence and talents are allowed to come in with financial aid. They do offer that. Um, I would be surprised to see if their census or composition of the class has changed much in the last two years, despite all their virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. So was there a specific incident that just made you realize that you have to take a stand and, and just push back against what is happening? Were other parents having any conversations about this? The, a number of parents. There were a number of groups. There was a, a woke at a Brentwood School group, uh, which met with the woke at Harvard Westlake group. But it was just a layering. It was one event after another, and it was the complete uh, discouragement and elimination of any kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. The If two families wanted to meet together with the headmaster, couldn't do it, one at a time. Mm -hmm. It was uh, separate. Con and conquer, and um, it was very frustrating. Then it was like a, a series or of latent anti-Semitic, in my opinion, conduct, which just added to the insult of having your kid learn the 1619 Project as the basis for American history. Can you give me some examples of what upset you so much at the Brentwood School? Well, part of it was this latent anti-Semitism that seemed to creep in as parents would object. Initially, uh, every different group was given an affinity group, which in itself is terrible. Like everybody has to have their piece of turf and defend it. What is an affinity group? Is it for the children an affinity group or is it for the parents an affinity group? And what is the affinity group based on? Is it Just color? Ra color, race, race uh, religion. Um, there was an Asian, Latino, African-American, Islamic, pride. Everybody had to have their turf since 2020 in order to, I guess, win, right? Win something. I'm not sure. Win a thought, win a process, win a curriculum change that benefited that group. So a number of Jewish parents asked for an affinity group to go along with the plethora of other groups. And we kept getting delayed. And, and we're busy. We're getting sidetracked. Then they said, we need two faculty advisors, despite the fact that Every group only needed one. So that took a few more months. And then they said, oh my gosh, um, we don't want you, the parents who are picking, who are asking for this group, we're going to pick our own leaders of the group. 
And then if you do want to be part of this group, you can't talk politics or curriculum. And then subsequently, there was another incident with um, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And the school sent out a memo talking about not being anti-Islamophobic and, and not condemning violence. And if you want to know the truth of the Middle East, here's a bunch of articles you should read. And every one was about Israel being apartheid, Israel being oppressor. It was the, the, the headmaster then apologized for that. But it was this layering of not overt anti-Semitism, but kind of like latent, oppressor, oppressed kind of ideology. So it's basically applied intersectionality at the school. So yes. there are these affinity groups, whether it, it based on race and the more victim bingo points you win, the more influence you have on the school and the less victim bingo win you, you have, yeah. then the less influence you have on the school. And then these affinity groups of parents influence the school to change curriculum or create certain programs Correct. based on that. And so if you are not in any of these affinity groups that have a louder voice, you basically have no voice within the school. Exactly. Right? It's kind of like 400 pride flags and no Pledge of Allegiance. Is that, I mean, it's basically racism against a certain race. It, you know, it, it's just the law of good intentions, right? Everybody in theory wants what's best, but in practice, they only want what's best for them. Right. And again, it's a lack of inclusivity. It's just really an odd way of showing how you want to be progressive rather than regressive. I want to get into the details of your lawsuit in a minute. Sure. Uh, but first, I want to ask you just a little bit more about the experience for your daughter. Did she come home and, and express any frustration? Are any of the other kids going along with this? Uh, how are the children in all of this? Because this is, you know, adults are fighting over woke or not woke. Where do the kids fit in as these, like, they're almost like a rope in this tug of war. I mean, the kids want to just fit in, right? For the majority, it goes in one ear and out the other ear. Uh, and they look to us. Mostly, she would come home and say, you're not going to like this, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're not going to like what we have today. And, um, and she was right. Mm -hmm. So what kind of steps did you try to take with the school to push? I mean, did you try to have some, you know, meetings or, I mean, I'm assuming you didn't go into a lawsuit on day one. No. Uh, phone calls and letters. And I even met with the head of the African American Parent Association. And I asked him, why did you get the book To Kill a Mockingbird banned? And he said, because it uses the N-word. I go, couldn't it be a teaching moment? I mean, I, I understand. I wouldn't want certain books disparaging Jewish people. And he said, no, we're not backing down. We've won. And I just said, I, I don't understand what you really won here, right? You won a change in curriculum. You've, you, you were winners in excluding books that are 75 years old and have a solid basis in teaching other children literature because mm -hmm. all these other books doesn't make any sense to me. He goes, well, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. That's where we are right now. And so eventually you complained, you met with, you know, all of these officials, and then what happened? So I wrote a letter to the board and said, this is how I think you've been, you've wronged the parents and myself this last year. It laid out several um, causes of action or allegations. And I said, I incorporated FAIR, a group FAIR into the conversation. And basically they just said, well, here's our, I got a letter back from the lawyer. Here's where you served the lawsuit. They were like, sue us. We sue don't us. care. No one, no one does, right? I think they just thought it was hot air. Right, right, because people usually don't sue. Yeah, no one. I've never sued anybody. This, this is the is, first time. This is your first time suing. First time lawsuit. Wow. Yeah, have to start somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Would you say that your daughter was impacted by this ideology and you were worried that she would come out of this school kind of not sharing your values? Or is the reason you're fighting for this is not just for her, but for a greater cause? I think it's for the greater cost. I can fix at my home what they're breaking at the school. Mm -hmm. But doesn't everybody deserve a seat at the table? And it was kind of a bait and switch, right? There, when they changed the curriculum or, or decided that they needed the hearts and minds, that's exactly the term they used. It hadn't been used since the Vietnam War with General Westmoreland. When they wanted the hearts and minds of my kid and they had to do it in eighth grade because by ninth grade they would not 
have been as amenable to learning these new concepts, okay, they didn't say, hey, if you don't like it, we're going to offer two tracks, right? We're going to have a traditional track and a more uh, progressive track, mm -hmm. right? Or they didn't say, here's your money back. When this started in September, in October, we applied to a new school. Wow. You know, there's a, so I grew up in Israel, and there was a story that I used to hear when going to synagogue, and it's about um, Honey the Circle Maker. And it's a, it's a very basic uh, children folktale that uh, Jews often share. And they say that the story is about this guy who planted a tree, and somebody comes up to him and says, well, why are you planting this tree? By the time this tree grows big enough, it's not going to do anything for you because you're probably going to pass away and be too old to benefit from the fruits of this tree. And then Honey answers and says, well, I planted this tree for the next generation, so somebody after me will be able to benefit from it. And so when I read the article about you, it really made me think about how many parents I meet with um, who really describe the same story that you're describing, that they feel like there was a bait and switch. They sent their kids to a certain school, but they're not getting what they expected, or that um, their children are almost harassed because they're not necessarily uh, compliant with this common narrative right now of victim bingo, right? They're, they, you know, they're just white kids and they're fine to be white kids. They don't feel like they need to be transgender or, or a victim of sure. some sort. And so, so many parents are upset with it, including conservative parents, but most parents all say to me, well, we're gonna wait for a couple of years I don't want my child to be in the middle of this. I don't want to be in the middle of this. I feel like I can inoculate my child at home. I can fix what they're trying to break. I can fix my child at home. There are very few people like you who say, well, this is not just about my own child. I'm going to teach my child an example here that it's not just about the individual, the individual child or even the individual family, but this is really about the entire community, right? When you do something that is probably painful for you and costly for you, yep. painful for your daughter, right? But all of you as a family, you are doing this really not for her or for you. You're doing this for the next generation of kids that are going to go into these schools. And if nobody fights, then we're going to lose everything. If no one holds them accountable, then there's no uh, direction. It's, it's just whatever. No, I, I'm not asking them to teach my daughter morals or social justice as exclusion to all other concepts, right? You want to be an educated person. Uh, and that's the reason we're going to these schools to hopefully create a well-rounded, uh, very educated girl or, or boy. But at some point, you know, like what did Bob Marley say? You have to get up, stand up for your rights. And most of these other parents are afraid of being canceled. That's a tremendous burden here. Uh, if you're an agent, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, uh, executive with a major company, entertainment company, you will be fired. You will lose your job mm -hmm. at this uh, other website or other group, Woke at Harvard Westlake, they modulate their voices and they blank out their faces mm -hmm. because they articulate a fear. Mm -hmm. uh, can you believe it? 2022 and people are afraid of standing mm -hmm. up for what is right or yeah. at least having a discussion. You can't even have a discussion. That's excluded. Mm -hmm. If you don't agree with the narrative that's being laid over on your kids, you are some kind of crackpot. How can that be? Meanwhile, they have all these anti-bullying programs at schools while they're sure, really the yeah. bullies of all bullies, right? And so you're not afraid of being bullied? <laughs> you know, I, I've kind of insulated our, myself from that. But yes, it, it happens. I've gotten some threatening emails, letters of my house uh, from this. But okay, I'm a big boy. I knew what I was stepping into. Yeah. Well, I think it's amazing because as parents we are so concerned with what our kids are learning, right? It was like, well, how is the academic, how are the academics at the school? But what an amazing lesson your daughter is learning beyond academics, right? To stand up for what's right and not, not to be afraid of the bullies and to do something that is for the next generation after her. I mean, could you imagine if she looks back and says to herself, well, maybe I didn't get the best calculus lesson or maybe not, I didn't have the best literacy teacher, which it sounds like they're not getting the best literacy teachers anymore they're doing, anyway. They're doing their best. But what she's learning from a character building perspective, which is what, in my opinion, makes for the most successful human being, right, is their characters and their values. She is getting so much even from this experience. Like, 
it, there is adversity in it, but I think there is also so much to learn from it. I hope you're right. Right now, she's a 14 year old girl who's, you know, in a social whirlwind. Yes. But, um, but I agree yeah. with you. Someday yeah. she will. So let's talk a little bit about the lawsuit. Uh, the first thing, when you picked up the phone and realized who I was when mm -hmm. I called you, you said to me, Marissa, I want you to know that this is not for the money. Right. And so what is, what is the lawsuit about? What are you suing? What is the cause of action? Well, there's multiple causes of action, but it would be for more inclusion, for more acceptance of people to have an honest debate about what should go into the curriculum for, for schools and for our kids. Um, there's also uh, allegations of some anti-Semitism. So if all these children have to read uh, Ibrahim Kandi's books, well, maybe they should read Anne Frank as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to give the whole school a day off to read Robin DeAngelo's White Fragility, maybe give them a day off to read another book of unity and not disruption. Hmm. So when you first met with your attorney, what was your attorney's re remark? You have a chance, not have a chance? Like, what is... Are you sure you want to go through this? And I said... Um, we met as a family, and um, I guess that's where we said yes. We'll try. It's been a very hectic whirlwind. It's been a lot of social media, mm -hmm. um, more so for my uh, daughter and wife than for me. Are there damages that you're hoping to get out of the lawsuit? Well, in the big picture, um, my goal would be I'd like my money back. Mm -hmm. Don't give it to me. Let's give it to a charity. And I like to pay the lawyer, and let's have some more inclusion. And I have some concepts on what that would look like. Uh, Jerry, have you been experiencing what I've been experiencing, which is the secret phone calls of thank you? Yes, and the texting, <laughs> right. and the we're behind you. But conversely, also like the parents who are in this, who have two or three kids going to the school, who are committed and have no other options, a um, little bit of pariah status too. Yeah. Any final words to the parents out there who are listening? Um, I like to have these conversations really with no judgment because I believe that God gives us different tools and different abilities yeah, to fight too. in whatever way we can, right? Some of us can just be upfront and take the arrows and some of us can do our work in different ways. So any final thoughts to any of parents who know you or who don't know you in other areas around the country who are just feeling kind of helpless and hopeless about what is happening to our kids in these schools? I would say there's nothing wrong with banding together, all right? You have, if you, at some point, when you get as mad as hell, you just don't have to take it anymore. And, and, and sometimes you have to do it on your own, and sometimes you are lucky enough to have a group stand with you. But most of the time, the only way out is through. I completely agree. I mean, kindred spirits, right? It I helps so. us get through all of that. Sure. And I hope PragerU has been an inspiration to you. That's, uh, Dennis was a big inspiration. I called him during the crux of this and he said, send your kids to a school that has your values or homeschool them. Hmm. Well, not all of us can homeschool, but at the very least, we can all try to fight in the schools that we're sending our kids to, you know, for a greater good all around. Especially when they're kids, right? When they're 18 years old or 21 years old, I understand exposure and they can have more prudence and judgment on their own. Mm -hmm. But my job now is to cover her, them till they're 18. Well, it's been so amazing to sit here with you. Thank you so much for your bravery and your integrity and for doing this for really the next generation. And just praying for you to have all the luck in the world. They'll need it. And thank you. Thanks thank again. Thank you very much.